Lord Jesus Christ, you fasted 40 days and 40 nights for justification to do our self-discipline in our sanctification. We're in chapter 16 with on dogmatism with uh, Dr. Justo Gonzalez is Christianity through the centuries, schismatic reaction, dogmatism. What is debated between the dogmatists and this, us is this, where is to be found the body of Christ, which is the church? We seek to answer in our own words or in those of the head of the body, our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, those who followed the monastic way of life expressed their dissatisfaction with the new order by withdrawing to the desert. Others declared that the church had been corrupted and that they were the true church. Of several splinter groups with similar views, the most numerous were the Donatists. The Donatist controversy was one more instance in which the church was divided over the lapsed and how they were to be restored. After each period of violent persecution, the church had to face what to do with those who yielded their faith, but who sought to be restored to the communion of Christians. Although there were similar issues and schisms in the East, it was mostly in Latin speaking West with its emphasis on law and order. And such schisms were most common and lasting. In the third century, this resulted in the schism of Novation in Rome and in North Africa. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, had to defend his Episcopal authority against those who held that confessors were the ones who should determine the lapse. Now in the 4th century, the debate over the Restoration became particularly virulent in North Africa. The persecution had been very violent in that region, and the numbers of those who had yielded was very great. As in other cases, those who yielded had not done so to the same degree. Some bishops avoided persecution by handing over to authorities heretical books, leading them to believe that they were script Christian scriptures. Others turned over the genuine scriptures, claiming that in doing so they were avoiding bloodshed. And this was their responsibility as pastors. Many, both clergy and lay, succumbed to imperial pressure and worshipped pagan gods. Indeed, the number of the latter was such that some chroniclers state that there were days when the pagan temples were full to overflowing. On the other hand, there were many Christians who remained firm in their faith and resulted in imprisonment, torture, and even death. As earlier, those who survived imprisonment and tortured were called confessors. Those who suffered imprisonment and torment, they were particularly respected for their firmness of their faith. At Cyprian's time, some of the confessors had been too ready to readmit the lapse without any consultation with the authorities of the church. Now, after Constantine's conversion, a significant number of confessors took the opposite tack insisting on greater rigor than the church was applying. These more demanding confessors claimed that the lapsed were not only those who had worshipped the gods, but who had handed over the scriptures to the authorities. If changing a tittle or jot in scriptures was such a great sin, argued the confessors, it is an even greater sin to turn the sacred text over to be destroyed. Thus, some bishops and other leaders were given the offensive title, traditores, that is, those 
were handed over or betrayed a title. Such was the state of affairs shortly. Let me just fix this here. At the end of the persecution, the very important bishopric of Carthage became vacant. The election fell on Sicilian. This was not popular with the rigorous party, which elected Major, Majoranus as his rival. In these elections, there were intrigues and unworthy maneuvers on both sides, so that each side was justified in claiming that his rival's election had been irregular. When Majorinus died shortly after being made rival bishop of Carthage, his party elected Donatus of Caesae Nigre, who became their leader for almost half a century. Naturally, the rest of the church was profoundly disturbed by this Donatus of Nigre, by this schism in northern Africa. For it was possible to acknowledge only one bishop of Carthage, the bishop of Rome, and several other important cities declared that Caesilian was, Caesilian was the true bishop, and that Majorinus and Donatus were usurpers. Constantine, who was greatly interested in keeping the church together so that he could unify his empire, followed the lead of these bishops sent instructions to the officers of northern Africa that they should acknowledge Sicilian and those in communion with him. This had practical consequences. For Constantine was issuing legislation in favor of Christianity, such as tax exemption for clergy. On the basis of the instructions to North Africa, only those in communion with Sicilian would enjoy these benefits or receive any gifts that Constantine was offering to the church. What were the causes of the Donatus schism? The foregoing is only an outward history of its beginning. But in truth, the schism had theological, political, and economic roots. The theological justification was the immediate cause of the schism and had to deal with the issue of dealing with those who yielded during time of persecution. According to the Donatists, one of the bishops who had consecrated Sicilian was a traditor, that is, had delivered scriptures to the authorities. Therefore, consecration itself was not valid. Thus, besides the factual question of whether or not this particular bishop and others in communion with Sicilian had yielded, there was an additional issue of whether an ordination or consecration by an unworthy bishop was valid. The Donatus declared that the validity of such an act depended upon the worthiness of the bishop. Cecilian and his followers responded that the validity of sacraments cannot be made to depend on the worthiness of the one administering them. For in that case, all Christians would be in constant doubt regarding the validity of their own baptism or of the communion of which they had partaken. Since it is impossible to know the inner state of the soul of the minister, one ministering the sacraments, there would be no way to dispel doubt regarding their validity. The Donatists, on their part, insisted that Sicilian, whose consecration had been flawed by the participation of a traditor, was not really a bishop for a reason. All those whom he had ordained were false ministers. whose sacraments had no validity. Furthermore, the other bishops, whose consecration was not in doubt, sinned by joining in communion with people such as Sicilian and his party. <clears throat> 
In consequence, their sacraments and ordinations were no longer valid. Where have we heard that before? Given the two positions, if a member of Cecilian's party decided to join the Donatists, a new baptism was required. The Donatists claim that a baptism administered by their opponents was not valid. But on the other hand, those who left the Donatist party were not rebaptized by Cecilian and his followers, <coughs> who held that baptism was valid regarding, regardless the worth of the person administering it. Besides the matter of the validity of sacraments administered by an unworthy person, the debate had to do with two very different conceptions of the church. The Donatists held that the church, being the bride of Christ, had to be pure and holy, while opponents pointed to the parable of the wheat and the tares which suggests that it is best for the disciples not to judge who is worthy and who is not, but rather leave that judgment to the Lord. For one party, the holiness of the church consisted of the holiness of its members, but the other was grounded in the holiness of the Lord. For the Donatists, what gave authority to a priest or bishop was his personal holiness. For their opponents, such authority was derived from the office, which was a common principle of Roman law. These were the main theological issues in the debate. But when one reads between the lines of the documents of the time, one becomes aware that there were other causes of conflict, often obscured by theological debates. Thus, it appears that among the Donatists, there were some who had delivered the scriptures to the authority, and even some who'd made an entire inventory of all objects that ch the church used in worship in order to give the inventory to the authorities. Yet these people were accepted among the Donatists. Further, the more one of the first leaders of the Donatism was a certain purpurious who murdered two nephews. Thus, it is difficult to believe that the real source of enmity between the Donatists toward the rest of the church was their concern for purity. It is a fact that the two parties separated along the social and geographical lines. In Carthage, in the immediate surrounding area of consular Africa, Sicilian and his followers were strong but further west in Numidia and Mauritania, the Donatists were very popular. Numidia and Mauritania were agricultural areas. A great deal of their produce was exported to Italy through Carthage. The net result was that the middlemen were Carthaginians with less labor and risk made more money from the crops than those who actually raised them. Furthermore, Numidia and Mauritania were much less Romanized than Carthage and the area around it. Many of the less Romanized areas retained their ancestral language and customs and saw Rome and everything connected with it as foreign and an oppressive force. In Carthage, on the other hand, there was a strongly Latinized class of landowners, merchants, and military officers, and this was the class that reaped most of the benefits of trade and other contacts with Italy. For these people, good relations with Rome, as well as the rest of the empire, were of paramount importance. In Carthage itself, it was the outlying districts there were numerous people among the lower classes whose feelings were similar to those of the Numidians and Mauritanians. Long before the advent of Constantine, Christianity had made significant inroads in Numidia among the lower classes of proconsular Africa.
the new faith of these converts with force even the empire could not overcome. At the same time, fewer members of the Romanized classes of Carthage had embraced Christianity. This brought into the Christian community some of the class tensions of the rest of society. But at those time, but at that time, those who were converted, particularly those of the higher classes, had to break many of their social con texts and therefore the tensions within the church were not as great as they could have been. The situation changed drastically with the advent of Constantine and the peace of the church. Now one could be a good Roman and good Christian. Following the lead of the emperor, the Romanist classes flocked to the church. Others from the same social strata who had been converted earlier saw this as a positive development. But the earlier decision was now corroborated by that of other important people. Christians from the lower classes tended to see the new development. <clears throat> Supposedly ignorant Numidians and Martinians and others knew the truth. All this may be seen in the various stages of the conflict. Sicilian was elected with the support of the Romanized Christians of Carthage. His election was opposed by the lower classes in proconsular Africa and by almost all of the people and clergy of Numidia. Before he had even time to study the issues being debated, Constantine decided that Sicilian's party represented the legitimate church. The same was decided by bishops of the great Latin cities and eventually those of the Greek cities. On the other hand, the Donatists were quite willing to accept the support of those members of the Numidian clergy who had weakened during the persecution. This does not mean that from the origins, Donatism was conscientiously a political movement. The early Donatists were not opposed to the empire, but to the world. Though for them, many of the practices of the empire were worldly. They repeatedly sought to persuade Constantine that he had erred in deciding in favor of Sicilian. Even as late as the reign of Julian during the second half of the century, some Donatists hoped that Roman authorities would see the error of their ways and come to the support of the movement. Around the year 340, there appeared among the Donatists a group called the Circumcellians, a name of datable origin, which probably means they had their quarter headquarters in martyr shrines. They were mostly Numidian and Mauritanian Donatist peasants who resorted to violence. Although sometimes they've been depicted as no more than bandits masquerading as people driven by religious motives. The truth is that they were religious to the point of fanaticism. They were convinced that there was no death more glorious than that of martyrs, and that now the conviction of the old style had ended. Those who had died in battle against the perverters of the faith were also martyrs. The Circumcellians became an important factor in the schism. Sometimes the Donatist leaders in town tried to dissociate themselves from this radical party but at other times they needed activist troops. They appealed to the Circumkellians. Circumkellians, yeah. This time, the time came when many villas and land holdings and secluded places had to be abandoned. The rich and those who represented the empire did not travel through the countryside without heavy escort. More than once, Circumkellians appeared at the very gates of fortified towns, 
credit suffered and tr trade came almost to a standstill. In response, Roman authorities had no recourse but to use force. There were persecutions, attempts to persuade the dissidents, massacres, and military occupation, all to no avail. The Circumkelians were the expression of deep discontent among the masses, and the empire was unable to stamp out the movement. As we shall see later, shortly after the Vandals invaded the area, thus putting an end to Roman rule. But even under the Vandals, the movement continued. In the 6th century, the Eastern Roman Empire, with its capital in Constantine, Tantanopal, conquered the region. But the Circumkelians continued. It was only after the Muslim conquest in the 7th century that Donatism and Circ Circumkelians disappeared. In conclusion, Donatism, particularly its radical branch, the Circumkelians, was the response to new conditions brought about by the conversion of Constantine. While some Christians received the new order with open arms and others withdrew to the desert. The Donatists simply broke with the church and had now become an ally of the empire. Even so, the serious theological questions they raised about the nature of the church and the validity of the sacraments would face Christians, force other Christians, notably St. Augustine, to deal with these issues. It was partly in response to the Donatists that Augustine and others developed their doctrine of the church, their view of the validity of the sacraments, and the just war theory. Thus, as is often the case, those whom the rest of the church eventually rejected as heretics and schismatics left their mark on the theology developed in order to refute them. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.